will internet shutdowns become the norm? Across the world, governments wanting to stifle dissent are blocking access and banning new platforms before they take hold. So, can tech companies and their users push back? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Over the past week, governments in Myanmar, India, and China have each disrupted the internet to clamp down on dissent. Although web shutdowns are not new, rights activists say it's a tactic that is now being used more often. Myanmar's army has routinely cut internet access since the coup on February the 1st. Telecoms have been ordered to block Twitter and Facebook. But protests against the military takeover continue to grow. Facebook is now restricting profiles linked to the army, accusing it of sharing misinformation about the rallies. India's government wants Twitter to remove more than 1,100 accounts it says encouraged violence or misinformation about the protests against new farm laws. The social media site deleted some users, but it refused to suspend the accounts of news organizations, journalists, and activists, saying doing so would violate free speech. The government has threatened to jail Twitter executives for up to seven years if they don't comply. India's Supreme Court is demanding responses from both sides before making a ruling. Emerging platforms are being targeted as well. People in China recently flocked to an American audio app called Clubhouse. It became a platform for uncensored discussions on sensitive topics, including the persecution of Uyghur Muslims and the democracy protests in Hong Kong. The government has since blocked the app. First, while China's internet is open, the Chinese government manages the internet in accordance with law and regulations. Second, China's position on the relevant issues has always been consistent and clear-cut. China has an unswerving determination to defend its national sovereignty, security and development interests, as well as to oppose interference by external forces. A recent report found Internet shutdowns across the world cost the global economy $4 billion last year. The UK-based digital privacy and security research group Top 10 VPN said disruptions lasted twice as long in 2020 than the year before. 21 countries were affected. India and Myanmar were responsible for the longest shutdowns. Disruptions cost the Indian economy more than $2 billion. The report found governments were using shutdowns to conceal violent abuses, often in response to protests, civil unrest, and during elections. All right, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from London, Alp Toker, founder and director of the Internet Monitoring Organization Netblocks. Here in Doha, Mark Owen Jones, Assistant Professor of Digital Humanities at Hamad bin Khalifa University, and in Bangkok, Matthew Buer, Head of the Asia Program at Article 19, an organization which promotes freedom of expression and information. Welcome to the program. Alp, let me start with you today. Could we see government shutdowns of the internet becoming normalized? And is this becoming a trend now, or are we just better at tracking these shutdowns? Well, so if you ask me, um, we've seen this normalization happen already uh, across the world. We're seeing internet shutdowns become part of the political discourse or even uh, a method for suppressing political discourse. This happens during elections, during uh, protests and during political scandals. So it is part and parcel of um, modern um, politics. And this is becoming a huge problem for societies across the world. Uh, is it a situation that is growing? Well, yes, it is spreading, but also we're becoming wiser to the situation because we're better able to monitor, measure, and advocate about it. So there is a, a dual nature to these incidents, and in a way, it's a, it's a developing incident for everyone. Matthew, I couldn't help but notice you nodding along to what some of what Alp was saying. Uh, did you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, I've spent most of the last two weeks dealing with the, the unfolding situation in Myanmar where there's been a military coup. And since the military took power, they've twice implemented a nationwide internet shutdown. Uh, as they were rounding up Aung San Suu Kyi and other government officials, they were uh, blocking mobile data access and they started throttling broadband internet. Um, I briefly lost track of, of colleagues and friends. Um, they've blocked access to, to the Internet. So this is really a tactic that, uh, that we're seeing increasingly in the region where I work, which is, which is Asia, uh, and has really grave human rights consequences. Mark, you know, we've seen a pattern emerge whereby governments uh, shut down 
one platform or a, an app, and then the activists that are using that app just migrate to another app or to another platform. Is the technology going to stay one step ahead of the governments going forward, or are the governments just going to be co-opting these new technologies? Um, I think it's a difficult uh, assessment to make, but what we've seen in authoritarian regimes or illiberal democracies is regimes adapting to new technology in such ways that they can either co-opt it or control it. We certainly saw with the Arab uprisings uh, from 2011 and since then, uh, some of the regimes willing to use these very crude nationwide internet lockdowns. Uh, but failing that, what the regimes tend to do is, is use tactics like social engineering, surveillance, infiltration, the use of spyware uh, to track and monitor activists. So I think in certain cases, um, regimes get a handle of the internet infrastructure and actually use, use that as a tool of social control. Uh, which is also extremely worrying. That's not to discount the worrying nature of internet shutdowns. They are equally problematic in terms of censorship, and they amount to a human rights violation. But I think any time a new social media app comes on the block, now people are talking about Clubhouse, regimes will obviously do a threat assessment and find a way to use that technology in a way that they can be used to either uh, track or monitor activists. Alp, what are some of the other countries where we've seen either full or partial internet shutdowns in the past year? So we've tracked some 35 countries where there were major shutdown incidents, and this includes social media blackouts as well as uh, total or near total internet blackouts. So these are nation scale incidents. That's a lot of countries. And these countries also tend to repeat uh, what they're doing. So there will be multiple instances per country. If I'm to look at some of the recent incidents, uh, Uganda stands out, January 12th this year, elections, uh, contested elections, and the public are trying to speak out, and internet is cut. First, social media are restricted, and then just on the eve of elections, the internet cuts out. So the people don't have access to political discourse online, and they're fed state media for the duration of the election and some period after. So that's one example. And if I'm to look at uh, perhaps some of the longer instances, I have to draw, um, draw attention to Ethiopia, which has had some very severe internet blackouts, which are ordered by the state, and they last for weeks, sometimes months. They're regional in cases. In other cases, they're national. And this has happened, for example, during the outbreak of uh, conflict in Tigray. Uh, just before the onset of conflict, internet cuts out in the region, and people in some cases aren't even aware that conflict has, has started with, with the uh, government. So uh, these are used really to control discourse during political incidents. And now we're looking at Myanmar, where it's all playing out again over the last uh, nine, 12 days. Matthew, I want to look more specifically at Myanmar for a, a few moments, um, because uh, Right now, you have an issue with Facebook there, where Facebook is trying to limit the spread of misinformation by Myanmar's military. They say that they will significantly reduce the distribution of all content on pages and profiles run by the military. Of course, Facebook is essentially synonymous with the Internet uh, in Myanmar. So many people use it there. It is ubiquitous uh, as a platform. But, of course, Facebook was also heavily criticized for allowing itself to be used to incite hatred especially against Rohingya Muslims in 2017. And in fact, Facebook in 2018 admitted that it failed to do enough to prevent its platform being used to incite violence and spread hate. So how significant a move is it right now that at this point in Myanmar, after this coup, that Facebook is taking these actions? So uh, it's been an evolution for Facebook. Uh, myself and, and friends were raising concerns about the way Facebook was being used to incite violence before a massive campaign of, of crimes against humanity and alleged acts of genocide, alleged acts of genocide against the Rohingya people. And Facebook did, frankly, very, very little. Um, Facebook has become much more active recently. They've directed more resources towards Myanmar, including by hiring local language uh, content moderators, and that's a really positive development. We're still urging them to do more, uh, specifically to, to be more transparent in their decision making. While they've taken some, some good steps or uh, against bad actors who are spreading misinformation, who are inciting violence, uh, 
the, the reasoning behind those decisions hasn't been great. And Facebook has also very clearly made politicized decisions at the request of the Myanmar government uh, in the past few years. For example, by giving blanket bans to uh, ethnic armed groups that are fighting against the Myanmar military in a way that was very clearly responding to a request from the government. So it, it's a it's a mixed bag. Facebook is doing much more now uh, than they have in the past, but there's still a lot more to be done, especially in terms of transparency. Mark, let's turn to China for a moment. The, the fact that, you know, in a country like China, people could at some point find and use an app like Clubhouse that just for a few days would allow them a glimpse of an uncensored internet. What kind of effect does that have in the long run? I mean, I think the internet, the impact of the internet across the world, uh, including in the Middle East region and China, ha has been fairly profound. I don't think anyone can deny that the accessibility of information online has uh, led to people exploring topics that were outside the curriculum, outside what they were allowed to study at universities. Uh, so I think the internet and accessibility to the internet for people, particularly in authoritarian or censorial regimes, is vital. And the same is absolutely true for China. The, the issue is, is that often these moments, uh, new technological change or even the development of new platforms, offer brief windows of hope and change. So there might be a period or a short period where one of these technologies is able to circumvent uh, aspects of uh, state control. But usually the states will uh, find and close that gap. And again, we saw this with the Arab uprisings, where people were holding up banners celebrating Facebook and Twitter. And then very quickly, it became clear that those platforms themselves were then being used to police citizens. So I think often when we have a new technology, we have a window of hope uh, that is closed uh, by the regime. And I, I assume the same will happen with China, which is obviously incredibly censorious. And I'd just like to make an, another comment on building off what Alp and Matt said. Um, one of the interesting things about disinformation um, and even misinformation is that's one of the problems that we see on these uh, social media platforms and we we often see the fact that they're unwilling to regulate themselves leads to the spread of disinformation and misinformation but simultaneously that's also one of the reasons regimes including in uganda uh, and Myanmar, used to justify their closures of the internet they say they're doing it for national security purposes and they're trying to stop stop disinformation and misinformation in fact that's largely not true uh, many of these regimes are responsible for spreading lots of mis disinformation so they just use it as a convenient excuse they're pegging onto the global backlash and the global attention on fake news in order to justify these authoritarian measures. Alp, there's a significant standoff going on right now between Twitter and India over the issue of freedom of speech. How do you see this playing out potentially? Well, it's a matter of information sovereignty, just as Mark said. Um, it's about who owns the narrative in a certain country. And there are also business interests involved. So these are companies they make money, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, they earn their money from advertisers. So they can't necessarily just pull back, withdraw from a country and say, you know, we're going to we're going to broadcast the people's voice all the time on these channels, on these on these online channels. They have to find a common ground. And this is where it all tends to break down, because uh, as soon as you're in that regulatory space where the country decides whether it's India, whether it's whether it's Uganda, whether it's whether it's Myanmar, you're working in that country's territory and you have to play by the rules whether or not those rules are necessarily fair so this is really where international uh, regulation starts come in how far can social media platforms push it and are there incentives for those platforms to do the right thing and it's not necessarily clear that right now there are enough incentives for them to do that i mean I'll, let me just follow up with you about that i mean it, it's you said that it's, it's unclear but do you think at some point there will be things that could be done, measures that could be taken to stop regimes and governments in different parts of the world from, from blocking or shutting down the Internet? Right. So this falls into two categories, the technical and, and I suppose, the uh, policy or the, the political. So can you find a, a way uh, to encourage these companies to do the right thing or can you find a technical means for them to be able to do the right thing without damaging their business interests? Or indeed, can you decentralize networks so people can communicate themselves without needing platforms? And so far, this hasn't really worked. There's a potted history in, in all, all two or all three of those categories, just because it's difficult to, to do this without incentivizing 
uh, those businesses. So uh, the technology comes, it's, it's a cat and mouse game where circumvention will happen, people will find a way around restrictions, but then those will also be blocked. And it's more or less the same with the companies as well. Uh, companies will push back for a while when there is an incentive to do so, when there's international spotlight, when there's an international uh, desire to do that. But as soon as the spotlight fades, it will go back to business as usual, where, where those independent voices aren't heard. So it's, it's a really challenging environment, and it's not clear things are necessarily getting better as fast as they should be. Matthew, let's turn back for a second to, uh, to India. The fact that internet shutdowns have been happening there, um, I mean, this is the world's largest democracy. Uh, the fact that the country's government is in a standoff uh, and a debate about free speech with Twitter, a social media giant, does that signal to you that more countries will be engaging uh, in, these, uh, in these tactics going forward? Uh, certainly. I, I, most of my work tends to be in East Asia and Southeast Asia, but that's something we're seeing in, in this region as well. Um, there's a lot of cases where we see uh, governments pushing social media platforms, for instance, to, to remove data that is critical or re remove comments that are critical of, of the government, uh, to localize data, data storage, to hand over information about activists, uh, about human rights defenders, about journalists, to government officials. A and a lot of times that, uh, that pressure is coming from authoritarian governments who have nefarious goals. That, uh, and when there's compliance by social media companies, it results in human rights violations. Uh, so, um, and, and just to, to echo something that, uh, that, that, that Alf was saying that I think was, was very useful, that there are both technological ways to push back against some of these uh, these episodes of censorship and, and internet shutdowns. And we're, right now we're trying to work with activists in Myanmar to access some of those tools. But then we also need to, to work on pushing on policy reform. And so, so Article 19 is doing that as well, working through the Human Rights Council, working with diplomats to try to ensure that governments that implement internet shut, shutdowns, that restrict ac access to social media apps, feel pressure and, and know that, that those actions are clear violations of human rights that will not be accepted. Mark, how challenging or how much more challenging does the situation become for activists in places like Myanmar or Uganda or China or India when there are internet shutdowns? And how much more difficult does the situation become for the protest movements in, in those countries or others? I think it's absolutely, uh, the internet has become essential, which is why it's Denial is often seen as often, or well, it is a human rights violation. As, as we live in an increasingly datafied society, much of our life is embedded in digital technologies, whether it's communication via WhatsApp or these other uh, social media platforms, whether we're talking about organizing or contacting our family. These are essential means of communicating with people we love and people we care about. From an activist and oppositional perspective, obviously these are essential for organizing uh, and communicating. So once that ability is removed, it's obviously hugely detrimental to the efficacy of, of such movements. Uh, and let's not forget as well, on, on a slightly related note, we're living in a pandemic, right? The internet is, is incredibly important right now, as loads of us live in social isolation. So whether it's Myanmar or elsewhere, you know, we, we, I think people are increasingly reliant on the internet as a, as a means to stay, to stay mentally healthy and, and, and such things. So, you know, there's a, there's a huge uh, issue of context here that I think is, is very important. Al, Matthew, just, uh, sorry, uh, Mark just hit upon something that I wanted to ask you about uh, as well, which is when it comes to the humanitarian costs uh, of an internet shutdown, especially during a health crisis, during a pandemic, uh, what does the impact of that look like? Sure, so um, the impacts are varied and they're across the board. I mean, we have the economic impact, and that's something we've been trying to assess at Netbox. It varies, but it's always high for the population. So, for example, Ethiopia, 4.5 million US dollars per day during an internet shutdown, and that adds up for, for a developing economy. But look at uh, Belarus, where you have a nation-scale internet shutdown uh, not too long ago, and the impact of that was in the region, the estimate was around 60 million US dollars per day, because it's an economic powerhouse of the region, where you have really all kinds of sectors there. You also have the tech sector just starting up there. And and what we see is that, yes, these are restrictions on political freedoms, on the future of people, 
to have their own voice, but it's also ruining the country's uh, bottom line. It's, it's damaging the economy, it's damaging uh, investor confidence in that country, and it's, it's generally pushing people away from, from that, that region. So Myanmar may get back, let's say things somehow uh, revert to normal, that still would, would leave a huge gap in, in, in terms of trust in the digital space and the digital economy, because that is now compromised. And when there's political instability, that means there's also going to be digital instability in that region. And it's very difficult to win that trust back. Matthew, I, I saw you nodding along again. It looked like you wanted to jump in. Please go ahead. Sure. I, we've been talking a lot about uh, Internet access in terms of freedom of expression uh, or the right to protest. I think we also need to keep in mind that access to information is a human right. And in the digital age, access to information usually means access to the Internet. Uh, people need to be able to protect themselves and educate themselves, make payments, conduct business. All of these things rely on, on access to information. And this is especially true in conflict zones. Um, access to, to information or access to the, to the Internet can really be the difference between life and death. Uh, in Myanmar, prior to the coup, there was uh, a year and a half long internet shutdown in Western Myanmar. And this is the region where the Myanmar military has been accused of genocide. Uh, and there's also an, a very uh, bloody ongoing civil war. Uh, and we were worried that the, the internet shutdown was being used as a veil to cover human rights violations, but also it had devastating impacts during the COVID-19 crisis. There was very credible reporting that many people in that area of the country didn't even know that there was a pandemic, let alone know how to access medical care or protect themselves or their families. Mark, of course, the telecoms have come under increased pressure and criticism from rights groups around the world for facilitating in these shutdowns, for caving to the demands of the governments. Do they have a choice, and do you think that we would see them push back in any significant way going forward? Uh, I think everyone has the choice, or everyone has the ability to use their political or commercial clout to actually stand by uh, or stand behind human rights legislation. I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's particularly the case when it comes to states that are allied with the countries in which uh, a lot of the platforms we've been talking about in particular are based. You know, one of the one of the more egregious examples I saw in the Gulf region was in, in, in the state of Bahrain, where they actually successfully shut down the internet in one small town for over a year uh, as, as they uh, attempted to isolate a, a group of political dissidents. Uh, and this, you know, had again a huge economic cost of about uh, 260,000 US dollars just for shutting down the internet in a small town. Now we know for example, who supplies the internet infrastructure and uh, supports uh, Bahrain, for example. So I think that leverage needs to be used, uh, especially when there's the ability to, to exploit political relationships and allied relationships in order to do that. Of course, it's going to be harder in somewhere like Myanmar, uh, which is somewhat more distant from, say, the US and, and Europe politically. Uh, but I think certainly uh, with a lot of the technological infrastructure uh, built by specific companies, I think that it can absolutely be uh, used and should be used as a tool of political pressure. Alp, we only have about a minute left. Let me ask you, do you think we're going to be seeing more companies, whether they be social media giants, uh, whether they be tech platforms, whether they be telecoms, pushing back uh, against governments who want to shut down the Internet? Well, we definitely need to see more of this because uh, these companies aren't doing enough to push back. I mean, there is more transparency now. That's something we weren't seeing. If you look at Telenor, for example, Norwegian, ISP, they have been putting out lists of orders that came from the uh, government in Myanmar, but it's still reactive. It doesn't happen in real time. And it only happens when there is that pressure from the outside. By default, there is no impetus. There's no incentive for these companies to actually really talk publicly about it. It is in their benefits in a way, in default, not to talk about it, because um, that could damage their, their public image. So a huge amount, you know, if, if there's a solution, it's in transparency. It's about how these companies act. Mm. It's about creating that space where they can speak out. All right. We've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all our guests, Alp Toker, Mark Owen-Jones, and Matthew Buer. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We're at at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.